Partnership's annual banquet. I'm Kim Casco, President and CEO of Business Partnership, and on behalf of the team and the board, thank you all for being here this evening. My gosh, it's just so great to be just back here in person, seeing all of you. Um, although I'll be, I'll be quite honest, I, I thought about wearing pajama bottoms, um, knowing that I was going to be behind the podium, but uh, uh, but we've got a great, great evening planned for you. Technically, this is our annual meeting, so we'll be sharing what the business partnership accomplished in 2021. We'll also be sharing our goals for 2022. And, we're, and most importantly, we're going to hear from the new president of the University of Iowa, President Barbara Wilson, about her vision for the university, as well as how she's engaging in the development of a vision for our entire community. So I couldn't be more excited to have her here and for all of you to, to meet her tonight. Before we dive in, I do want to acknowledge and thank our annual banquet sponsors. This event wouldn't be possible if it weren't for their generous support. Starting with our lead sponsor, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble provides branded products and services of superior quality and value, which serves nearly 5 billion of the more than 7 billion people on the planet today. p and thank you for continuing to generously sponsor this event. Thank you also to our supporting sponsors, Newman Munson Architects, Online Communications, and the University of Iowa. from the team or an ambassador looking to check in, I encourage you to take it. Learning about your needs and challenges in real time is critical, especially now, to our continuous improvement and taking the pulse of our business community. We delivered a new educational program this past fall that was specifically intended to help businesses get back to growth mode after a turbulent 2020. It was a deep dive on the entrepreneurial operating system, otherwise known as EOS, which is a strategic planning and operating framework designed to take your business to the next level. 
We began using EOS at the Business Partnership in 2019 and were excited to share it with others. In fact, our attendees found the event so valuable that we started an EOS peer-to-peer -peer group to keep the learning going. We plan on continuing to offer world-class professional development opportunities such as this in the year ahead. Since 2019, we've been advocating to increase the quantity, quality, and affordability of childcare to address a large barrier to workforce participation. While we still have a long way to go, we had a few big wins this past year. Two bills were passed at our state capitol that address childcare, and we're hoping for more this year. Locally, we are co-leading the Johnson County Child Care Coalition, which launched two new programs to support child care professionals. Lastly, because of her tremendous work in this space, Jennifer Banta, our VP for Advocacy and Community Development, was selected to be on the Governor's Child Care Task Force and helped shape the new programs the Governor announced this past November. Awesome. In May of 2020, we partnered with the Iowa City Area Development Group, Iowa City Downtown District, and Think Iowa City to launch an effort we dubbed Project Better Together to pool resources and galvanize action in response to COVID-19. As we started to stabilize in early 2021, we shifted the effort from a reactive mode to a proactive focus on our future and launched Better Together 2030. We contracted a consultant with expertise in developing community visions and assembled a steering committee that represents a cross-section of our community. The goal is to launch a vision and execution plan this spring for what we want our community to look like, feel like, and be like in 2030. You'll hear more about this later in the program. Lastly, what I'd like to share is our commitment to making our community a welcoming and inclusive place for all to grow and thrive. We realize the role we play in cultivating that culture and ensuring our systems and practices are inclusive and equitable. This past year, we did a number of things internally to improve on DEI, such as increasing the diversity of our staff, board, committees, and membership, and hosting diversity conversations with BIPOC business leaders externally. And externally, we lobbied for legislation that promotes welcoming environments. We also launched an effort in partnership with ICAD, Asteed Planning, and the Racial Equity Connect Collective to improve the inclusiveness of our business support ecosystem. We'll continue this important work ahead in 2022. Bottom line is that the team at the Business Partnership is doing a lot for your businesses, as well as the overall community. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the team. Jennifer, Beth, Aaron, Bianca, and Evan, our intern, along with Kim. Please uh, wave wherever you are. Stand, wave. I see waving. Thank you all for your hard work this past year. Second, I'd like to acknowledge the many super engaged members we have who volunteer their time on various committees at our various events. If you're a member of one of these groups, please stand and stay standing for a moment. Our ambassadors, our business council for legislative affairs, our CLP Programming Committee. We could not have been able to accomplish everything that we have without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your time and dedication to this organization. And lastly, I want to recognize my peers who serve with me on the Business Partnerships Board of Directors. I'm extremely grateful for the wisdom and guidance you've generously provided during this past year, whether in person or via Zoom. Fellow board members who are here tonight, please stand.
thank you all. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kim. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'd like to also take a moment to acknowledge Nick here for his leadership as board chair. Uh, he's a true, true servant leader whose passion for community, his energy, as you can see, his humor, and his really awesome radio voice uh, successfully guided us through uh, this past year. Nick, thank you for your hours of service to us as well as to this community. As Nick highlighted, we accomplished a lot in 2021. I too am grateful uh, for a fantastic board, for dedicated volunteers, for a super talented and driven, often overly ambitious team. Um, we also have many, many partners we need to thank uh, as well. Uh, it is part of the reason we changed our name to partnership. This work really takes a lot of it. I'd like to start with our peer economic development partners. Will the staff and board members present from the following organizations please stand and stay standing? Iowa City Area Development Group, Think Iowa City, Iowa City Downtown District, Cedar Rapids Metro Economic Alliance. Stay standing, get up. <laughs> this work, that's right. <laughs> This work is incredibly, incredibly hard, and there's just nobody I'd rather be, be doing it. So, so thank you to our partners there. I also want to acknowledge and thank our elected officials. One of the key things the business partnership engages in for our members is public policy advocacy. We appreciate the working relationships we have with our various elected officials. If you are a federal, state, local elected official, or a school board member, please stand. I know there's some of you here. <laughs> thank you for being here. And more importantly, thank you for your service. Lastly, I want to acknowledge and thank all of you, our members. Now, I won't make you all stand, um, but I do want you to know that we consider you our partners, our partners on our mission of building community by strengthening local business. Thank you for your continued investment in us this past year and your dedication to this community. I want you to give your, yourselves a round of applause. I'd now like to welcome to the stage our current board chair, Adam Cuny, to give you an overview of our goals for 2022. Adam is the co-founder and chief growth officer of Higher Learning Technologies. He also serves on the Iowa Innovation Council and is co-chair of the EdTech Initiative. This is the perfect year to have him at the helm and lead what we think are, are, are a pretty solid set of ambitious goals. Welcome, Adam Cuny. Oh, thank you, Kim, and uh, always tough to follow Nick, because Nick, I'm buying whatever you're selling. I'm just, that buttery voice gets me every time. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Kim. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm incredibly honored to serve as your 2022 board chair and to follow in the footsteps of Nick, who uh, has left me with some big shoes to fill. Our theme for this year is forward motion. We've learned how to preserve despite so many obstacles the past two years. Now we have a bright future ahead of us with a lot of great things going on that the, our community should be really excited about. In 2022, we'll be moving forward to take, the next, to take the business partnership and our community to the next level. We have three big goals we'll be focused on this year. The first is to develop a new business model for the business partnership. We are looking to revamp our dues model, in particular, so that it aligns with where we are trying to take the organization and ensures long-term sustainable growth. This, along with a continued focus on internal organizational effectiveness, will give us more time to do what we love most, creating values for our members and having an impact on this community. Our second big area of focus is to address the workforce crisis. 
I think we've all been there. We all know it's very difficult to find great employees now, and we know the lack of qualified people to fill the jobs is the number one pain point for the businesses, uh, business community is facing. This is not necessarily a new challenge. Although our community is growing, we are constantly, we are the only state in the nation that has not doubled in population since 1900. Slow population growth plus the impact of the pandemic has created an even more acute talent problem that is inhibiting our economic growth. It is gonna take all of us working together across organizations to address the workforce crisis. In partnership with the Cedar Rapids Metro Economic Alliance, we are advocating at both state and federal levels for policies that will help us grow, retain, and attract a skilled workforce. In partnership with the Iowa City Area Development Group, we will develop aligned solutions that serve all types of businesses, large and small. And in partnership with our K through 12 schools, higher education institutions, <clears throat> and our businesses, we'll look for ways to innovate how we are preparing our children for the world of work. This is an all hands on deck issue that is gonna require a lot of collaboration and creative ideas. Lastly, our third big goal is to launch and begin execution towards a long-term vision for the community. Nick spoke about this work earlier and President Wilson and Kim will be sharing more with you in a bit. This is gonna be a game changer for our community and another area where we're gonna need many of you to be involved. In addition to the three, three strategic goals, we're going to continue programs to encourage local buying, bring back some of our past favorites like our golf classic event this summer, everyone get excited for it, I am, uh, and to offer new development opportunities such as the executive leadership program in partnership with the University of Iowa's Tippies College of Business. We are also going to continue our efforts to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion, both internally and externally. In partnership with our economic development peers, we will be launching a DEI index this spring. We'll be asking businesses across the region to complete the assessment for their own benefit, as well as to help us pinpoint common areas of need across the region. Please stay tuned for more. Thank you all for your continued support of our work. Uh, please do not hesitate to uh, contact myself, Kim, or any of the staff if you have any questions about things you shared. And I think the biggest takeaway I'm hoping all of us can come with tonight is we're going through a, a very divisive time now as a state, as a country, with all of the noise and everything going out there. And it really will take all of us coming together as one to drive this state, this community, and this country forward. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to give it back to Kim. Thank you, Adam. I'm just so excited for the year we have ahead of us. Okay, it is now my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Barbara J. Wilson began her term as the 22nd president of the University of Iowa on July 15, 2021. She earned her bachelor's degree in journalism and her master's degree and PhD in communication arts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She came to Iowa most recently having served as the Executive Vice President and Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University of Illinois System, where she was also a member of the Illinois faculty at Urbana-Champaign for 21 years. President Wilson's research focuses on the social and psychological effects of the media, particularly on youth. She is co-author or co-editor of four books and over 80 research articles, book chapters, and technical reports. She's a native of Appleton, Wisconsin, and her spouse, John Lammers, who is also with us tonight, is a retired professor of communication, and they have two grown daughters. Before I have President Wilson uh, come up here, I'd like to say that I've just been so, so impressed with how she has really hit the ground running and has gotten so engaged uh, in our community from day one. Um, for example, we asked her to be tri-chair of the Better Together 2030 uh, initiative. I think it was her first, her first week of work, uh, and she readily said yes. I'm not sure if she knew what she was getting herself into, but man, are we, are we grateful she said yes, because um, I can't tell you how, how grateful we are to have her engagement, her insights, and her leadership in this community. Uh, please welcome to the stage, President Barbara Wilson.
Thanks, Kim. Thank you, everyone. It's great to see you all here, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I, I hate it when pictures go up like that of me because I think, do I look older now than I did when that picture was taken? Or is that, you know, and I think, no, I'm good. It's been seven months and I'm not that much older. You, you know, uh, uh, truthfully, it's been fabulous. I am approaching my seventh month anniversary as the new president. So some days I say to my husband, it feels like we've been here for five years, and then other days it feels like it's only been a week. So it depends on the, on the particular day and the issues that we're, that we're dealing with. I am so excited to be here. Uh, we've crossed the Mississippi. We've come uh, from one I state to another. Uh, but it's been a great move, and I want to thank all of you for welcoming us so um, energetically and so enthusiastically. I feel like we've come to the right place at the right time. Uh, as Kim mentioned, I was, we were both at Illinois for 21 years, and I have lots of observations about the differences between Iowa and Illinois. Um, but let's just say people don't usually talk about Illinois nice, okay? They just don't. So I am thrilled to be here, and we've had such encouraging and wonderful conversations. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about, or this evening about where we're headed as a university. And the reason I wanna do that with you is because I feel like uh, all of the things we just heard about with this business community, all the things you care about are connected dramatically and intimately to the University of Iowa. And I hope you feel that way. So I wanna give you a sense of where we're headed. I can't give you a preview to our strategic plan, which we're in the process of, of finalizing, but I can give you hints around the edges of where we're going, what we're thinking about, and how we want to engage in this wonderful community. But before I do that, let me just stop and say that um, I meet with many, many students over the course of the last few weeks. In fact, we had about 20 students over for dinner last night. And every single time I ask the question, why did you come to Iowa? Why are you here at Iowa? And many of them are from Illinois, by the way, just you probably know that. Um, and what I often, often hear is, I came here and I walked around the campus and I walked around Iowa City and I just felt like this was the place I wanted to be. So I share that with you because I really want to encourage you to think about us working as a collective. We need you, I think you have recognized you need us and the stronger we work together, the more we're gonna create that talent, attract that talent, and keep them here in the state of Iowa. That's what we're all about, and we welcome all the different opportunities that we can uh, engage in to do that together. So I'm gonna go on a little brag fest for the, and get that picture off of there. Oh, I've gone in the wrong direction. You don't wanna go there. There we go. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through a couple of things that we're focusing on, some data points that you may or may not know that might help you as you think about recruiting talent to this community and you uh, think about hiring our students. Uh, we're very proud of where we're headed and, and maybe you've noticed that we brag a lot when good things happen and then when they, good things don't happen, we don't talk about it very much. But. Um, <laughs> But on the good news front, we have uh, seen a real, a real strong increase in our rankings. We don't pander to the rankings. We don't spend a lot of time strategically thinking about how to get US News and World Report to rank us higher. But when the rankings go up, we're really excited about it because we know that students and families pay a lot of attention to rankings when they make choices about what university to come to. So I'm really proud that, that this year we experienced an increase in rankings. Now, if it goes down in the future, you won't hear me talking about rankings, but right now we're gonna talk about them. We've gone up, as you can see, one spot in pub among public universities. And I have to tell you, it is really hard to move the needle on these rankings because all these universities are clustered pretty closely together on metrics. And to move the, the needle is, is, is not easy. So we're proud that we went up one spot among publics and we went up five spots among uh, private and public uh, universities together. So that's a, good, that's a bit of good news and it suggests to me that we've got a lot of good momentum that we're gonna capitalize in the next couple of years on. Uh, why did we go up? Well, some of the metrics are really important ones that we would be focusing on anyway, like first year retention. Are we keeping students in the, at the university? If they come in the first year as freshmen or whatever year they are, do we keep them into the second year? And as it turns out, if you keep students the first two years, you have a much higher possibility of getting them to graduation, which is what we all want, right? So first year retention is one of those metrics. Graduation rates for Pell students, Pell students 
students or students who have financial need and they are awarded Pell Grants at the federal level. That's another thing that's measured by the U.S. News and World Report. And of course, um, what we really like is when they measure things that we're really good at, like the number of small classes that we offer at the university compared to our peers. So this is some good news. Even more exciting for me is that we've uh, cracked the top 10 on two rankings this year. First one is uh, writing across the disciplines. Actually, I think we were top 10 for two years in a row. But the important thing about this ranking is it's a, it's a sense of how important is writing across the disciplines. And why I'm so excited about this is look at our competition. Uh, in the top 10 are, you know, institutions like Harvard and Stanford and Duke and, you know, just those kind of places, and the University of Iowa. We are the only public in the top 10 amongst these Ivy League schools. And that's something to be really proud of. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to become a novelist. You can clap. Yes, that, let's clap. Thank you. Here's my architects working on a writing building right near our, but that's okay. I know that we all, we care about writing regardless of whether it's related to our architectural projects. Um, but the thing is, you know, what we tell students, and this, we have a writing center in the Tippy College of Business. We have a writing center in engineering. We have a writing center in class. What we tell students over and over again is writing and communication skills are your path to leadership, no matter what your discipline is. So this doesn't mean everybody wants to become a novelist or a poet. It means that we're teaching students, unlike any other public institution in the country, we're teaching students how to think critically and how to express themselves both in writing and in oral communication. I'm really proud of that, and I hope you are too. It is a very big brag point for us, and it means, yeah, go ahead and clap again. Yes, we're all very proud of that. I can, I can see some of you want to clap, so I'm going to encourage it when I see it. Um, another really important ranking that the first time ever U.S. News decided to rank undergraduate nursing programs, and we cracked the top 10 for that new ranking as well. So f in the top 10 for nursing, for the, B for the B.S. and degree. And again, really tough competition there. Now we've got to find ways to open up more slots in our College of Nursing, but we're going to work on that uh, because we know we're going to get much more attention there. So those are some really important kind of brag points that I want you to know about. But there are a lot of amazing programs at Iowa. And I just uh, asked our team to pull together some just examples of how many of our programs are in the top 10 across the university. These are all national rankings. I mean, we're the number one program in physician assistance. That's amazing. But look at this. We've got audiology. We have um, a social psychology. We've got printmaking. So it's not just STEM. It's not just medical. We've got top-ranked programs across our disciplines. And frankly, that was one of the things that really attracted me to this position. I came from an institution that was a little more lopsided. It had very strong um, programs in certain areas, but other areas were sort of riding on the coattails of those strong programs. And the beauty about Iowa is that we are strong across disciplines. We're strong in the arts. We're strong in the humanities. We're strong in medical areas, and of course, in engineering and business as well. So this just gives you a sense of the top 10 programs. We could, I, If I dipped down to 15, we'd have a lot more in here. But the point is, we're attracting a lot of attention from students all over the country who are interested to come here to, to be part of top programs. Just last night at our dinner table, we had two uh, dental students, D3 students, and they said, uh, I didn't know this, but College of Dentistry actually offers 13 different sub-disciplines in dentistry. Did you even know there were 13 ways to specialize in dentistry? Anyway, I learned something every day from our students, but they said we came here from different states because you have a top, we have a top dental school here in certain programs. So you can go anywhere and see the excellence across our disciplines. All right, what else can we uh, excite you about and brag about a little bit? One thing we're particularly interested in always is our external research funding, partly because it's a measure of excellence for a research one institution to bring in research dollars, but also because all these dollars are coming into our community and they're pumping our economy. Every time we get a big grant from a federal agency or from a foundation, we're hiring more students, we're hiring more faculty, we're hiring staff, and we're 
we're feeding the economy through different kinds of innovative aid of, uh, research. And you can just see some examples here. NASA, it, we're one of the biggest places, biggest universities for NASA funding. And our space physics program is, of course, world renowned. And we have a regular connection with NASA, bringing in big dollars from NASA. But of course, because of this huge medical complex, we have a lot of NIH money that we bring into the community. Some of this is COVID related, but it's, it's also connected to cancer research and Alzheimer's and all kinds of other medical issues that we're working on every day, cochlear implants and other things that are some, some well-known issues and some less common uh, diseases and, and treatments that we're working on. So research funding is on the rise. Some of it's related to COVID, but other of it's it just related to our really busy faculty writing lots of research grants. Um, and another thing I talk to a lot of people about is our impact around the state. And so uh, many of you know I'm beginning to get more out into Iowa and visit with our legislative community outside of Iowa City. People warn me right from the beginning, get out of the bubble, get out of the Iowa City bubble, get around the state, let people know what this university is doing for the state. And that's an easy case to make, actually. Here's just some examples I share with our legislators. Eight out of 10 dentists in the state are trained by our dental school. So if you care about your teeth, you should care about the University of Iowa, right? Um, we, yeah, there you go. Okay, we could clap about that. No, I'm kidding. Okay, all right, let's clap. Um, another really important statistic, five out of 10 physicians in the state are trained by the University of Iowa. Five out of 10 pharmacists in the state are trained by us. Another uh, really important statistic, we have something called the State Hygienic Lab, which has been very busy doing a lot of COVID testing but they also do all screening for every newborn in this state to check for genetic illnesses and diseases for free, okay? People don't realize this, but we are making sure that our population is healthier uh, right from the beginning, from the, from the infancy period. And we also do testing for South Dakota, North Dakota, and Alaska but we charge them for the testing, okay? So you can look around here, around this little map here, we're constantly trying to emphasize that we are a partner, we are making an impact on the state, we are doing things across the state, including now training K through 12 teachers on mental health issues and mental wellness wellness issues across the state. That's a critical need right now, and our College of Education is busy with a new center helping the state on that with help from the state. We, ha we received funding from the governor to, to launch that effort. So a lot of work on, on business development, and I saw David here somewhere from JPEC. Where did he go? He was in here somewhere. There he is right there, working uh, with startup companies, but look at how many employees uh, employers have their employees using our coming to us and joining our online programs and learning more about how to make their businesses better no matter where they're located so our online IBM program uh, MBA program is going like crazy right now so I could go on and on but just gives you a sense of our impact around the state all right what are we going to be focusing on the next couple of years in addition to some more specific priorities, we have some very general priorities that I hope will uh, make you feel good about where the University of Iowa is headed. One is we're gonna be laser focused on increasing retention and graduation rates. Um, now, I, I would be lying if I said, you know, we don't care about the rankings at all. We are, you know, excited to be highly ranked and improving our retention and graduation rates will help our rankings, but it's the right thing to do. Right? We, we have a moral uh, obligation to, to get all students through as quickly as we can and get them a degree. And we have some work to do on that front, and I'll show you some data in a minute. We're also going to be working very uh, carefully and very vigorously on keeping our talent here and attracting more talent on the faculty side. So for those of you who'd like to engage with our faculty uh, in whatever capacity you do that, we want more of them. We want to keep the ones we have here, and we want to continue to to grow our faculty. We are spending a lot of time talking about mental health and wellness. I'm sure many of you are doing that in your companies and in your homes and in, in the community. We have to do it for students and faculty and staff as well, and I'll talk about that. And certainly last but not least, we are working hard on DEI initiatives, and I'll give you a flavor for that too. So let's deal with each one of these. This is my smallest hard to read slide. I apologize for that. Um, so if you can't see it, just 
don't worry, I'll try to walk you through it quickly. But this gives you a sense of what our competition is all about. And you know, if you're not competitive in this field, you're going to get passed behind. So we look at uh, what is our re retention and graduation rates relative to our peers. And these are our peer group comparisons set by, uh, by us in consultation with the Board of Regents. And you can see, if you can't see, I'll tell you, it's UCLA, Michigan, UNC, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, where I got all of my degrees, so I'm a little competitive there, I'd like to beat them. Uh, Illinois, where I came from, I really want to beat them. And uh, the Ohio State University, kind of feel competitive there too, Minnesota, Indiana, and Arizona. And what you can see if you can read this is that just if you look at retention rates, we're at about 87%. That's how, what percent of our students go from first year to second year successfully. They hang with us. But look at our competition, folks. Uh, 90, 93, 96. Now we're never going to be at 97 or 98 because Michigan and UCLA are way more selective and they are almost functioning like private institutions. That's not who we are. But we should look more like Illinois and Wisconsin, frankly. And that means getting our retention rates up over 90%. It's going to take us a lot of work to do that, but we're very focused on it. And uh, it will help us and it will be the right thing to do for our students. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we look really good on class size. So we're one of the top ranked in terms of having smaller classes compared to some of these big universities, and we don't have as many big classes. So if you think we're all about big lectures, it's not true. And in fact, one of the things our students tell us is, you're big, but you're small. And that, to me, is our secret sauce compared to some of these other institutions. You're big, you give lots of opportunities, I can major in lots of things, but when I come to this campus, it feels like a small community. And I'm just telling you, I don't hear that about The Ohio State University, okay? So that's, we're thinking about what's our competitive edge all the time. So we'll be working on that. Oh, before I go on, let me tell you, we're, um, we're, uh, we're also looking at graduation rates, and, and we're a little behind there, but that makes sense because retention rates feed into graduation rates. All right, what are we doing on this front besides worrying about it? Well, we're actually investing money in it and trying to boost our, in, our retention and graduation rates. A couple of things. Many of you have heard about our P3 uh, utility partnership here, and we're investing that money every year that we, that we uh, have off of that, uh, of that great partnership in new ideas and new programs. We're using some of it to boost retention and graduation rates. One of the things I'm really excited about is we just piloted something called the First Gen Hawks program. Uh, it turns out that one out of five of our students is first in family to go to college. One out of five. So we have a huge commitment for those students who do not have a mentor at home or in their family that can tell them, if you're not doing very well, go see your professor during office hours. That just seems like such a simple kind of recommendation, but if you don't have anyone else in your family who went to college, you're not going to get that kind of mentoring. So we piloted a new program with 61 students. We wrapped peer mentoring around them. We gave them coaches. We uh, put them in particular sections of tough courses to ensure that they would succeed. And in one year, we raised the retention rate to 92% for this small pilot group of students. That's, that's better than our average. Yeah, yeah. So when I say we want to boost it, we know how to do it. Now this program is labor and, and fiscally intensive, so we're going to have to raise money to do it. But we already know a lot of our donors and our friends care a lot about first-gen students, and I hope you do too. So this is something we'll be working on. We've also asked the state for some money to help us with student success, so stay tuned. We're hopeful about that. We're hearing good things out of Des Moines, but you never know until you really know. So anyway, okay, so that's what we're going to be doing there. We're also spending a lot of time talking about retaining and recruiting faculty. Uh, and again, our talent, we are, have to be a talent magnet for the best out there. So we're working on a couple of new programs. We launched something called the Transformational Faculty Hiring Program, which I'll just talk about briefly. And we're doing a couple of other programs as well in an effort to keep the best here and to attract, to just ruthlessly steal faculty from other universities is basically what we'll be doing. And we're asking for some help 
from the state with that as well. So let me give you a sense of why it's so important to have talent. Here's just a, an example. I'm hoping you know some of these people, and if you don't, you should pay attention to them. If they're your neighbors, be nice to them. We want to keep them here, okay? Um, but just recently, the, the AAAS announced its awards. This is a national uh, award. It's very competitive. You have to go through a lot of process to nominate people, and not very many are awarded this. And this year, seven Iowa faculty were named AAAS Fellows. It's the largest professional association of its kind. And you can see they come from all different disciplines, these folks. And I'm telling you, the minute they become a AAAS Fellow, guess what happens? Other universities start looking at them and thinking, hmm, how do we get Ed Wasserman to move to our university? So these are the kinds of examples of people that we've got to keep here and got, we have to keep them happy. And then we have to attract the next generation of AAAS, AAAS scholars. And it's not just AAAS, Association for Advancement of Science. This year alone, four of our faculty received NEH fellowships. These are Nash, very competitive awards from the National uh, Endowment for the Humanities. And you can see they're in different departments around our campus. They're working on book projects. They're working on, in one case, health communication. It's just amazing what these, these faculty are doing. Again, if they're your neighbors, be nice to them. We got to keep them here in Iowa. But it's an example of how important our talent is. So what are we going to do to attract more of these people? Well, we launched something called the Transformational Faculty Hiring Program just about a week or two ago. And I call it the Ted Abel effect. I don't know if any of you know Ted Abel, but he is an amazing faculty member at Iowa. We poached him from Penn a couple of years ago. Literally, how do you steal someone from a private institution? It's not easy. But what you have to do is convince them that they can come to Iowa, do great things, be surrounded by smart people live in a community with fabulous restaurants, no commute time, and we're going to give you some goodies so that you don't have to start your lab all over again. We're going to give you startup funds. We're going to uh, help, help support your postdocs and your graduate students. So we recruited Ted uh, 2016 or thereabouts. He helped us with uh, founding the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, which is a fabulous institute that now has 120 faculty from across disciplines connected to this institute, studying the brain and how it intersects with depression and anxiety and also looking at the brain and Alzheimer's and dementia. So these are going to be world amazing uh, con uh, contributions to, to uh, neuroscience. And Ted, who is the humblest guy you'll ever meet, has helped us recruit 20 new faculty from around the country. He's helped increase our research funding. And he's also launched an undergraduate major in neuroscience. So this is the kind of thing we want to, yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you know Ted, pat him on the back, buy him a cup of coffee, tell him he has to stay in Iowa. But this is our goal is to hire three to four of these faculty every year for the next few years because they are game changers. They're people that are already doing great things around the country. We get them to Iowa and they'll do even greater things. So talent magnet. Okay, mental health and wellness. Uh, we could go on and on about mental health, and many of you, I'm sure, have your own stories and your own concerns about mental health. I'll just tell you that today, uh, well, without a pandemic, roughly 30% of students who come to our universities have diagnosed uh, issues around depression or anxiety. So one out of three. Okay, now that's a lot for us to manage and to make sure that we find supportive environments for students who are going to need help with things like time management, who might need some help with medications, who might need some yoga and, 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 and uh, resiliency skills and all the things that we want to do to make sure these students are successful. During the pandemic, national surveys now suggest it's 80%. 80% of students at universities are saying, I'm anxious about the future, I'm lonely, I don't really know where we're headed, I could use some help. 
So uh, I'm sure you know this, this is not just university, it's K through 12 as well. And our goal is to make Iowa a place that helps every student, that really wraps services around students, that ensures that we teach students. Uh, we, we say to students, we can't take away your depression, we can't take away the stress of society, but we can help you manage, we can help you with coping skills, we can help you with resilience. So we're doing a lot of work around that, including launching with community in this community, a new 24, yay, yeah, a new 24-7, 365 day a week text service for students. Yeah, because here's the deal. <laughs> students say to us, I need help not at eight in the morning, because you're up, but I'm not, okay? I'm gonna need help at 10 at night. That's when the anxiety creeps in, or that's when I could use some support. And so we have to find ways to really reach out to students all hours of the day, and we're doing a lot more, and we're also asking for some state support to help us with mental health and wellness. Okay, I think I'm getting really close. Sorry, you can tell I get excited about where we're headed. DEI, we are working just like you are on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the way that I really think about this is how do we bring students from all across the world, but certainly across the country, into this place called Iowa City, University of Iowa, Coralville, North Liberty, and how do we help them belong? How do we give them a sense of belonging? And it's not just race and ethnicity, it's rural versus urban, it's international students, it's students with disabilities, it's students who are coming from other countries. So we really think about diversity is, as a multi-layered kind of set of, of issues that students come to us with, and we want to make sure everybody feels connected as quickly as possible. So we're working on a lot of activities here. We have a new four-day program. We bring students from underrepresented groups in early so that they're not moving in the same day as everybody else and they can get acclimated to campus. But we're also working, we have something called BUILD, which is a certificate program and faculty, staff, and graduate students can sign up to take classes to learn how to be more sensitive around diversity issues and we've already trained over 3,000 of our people who said, I want a commitment to DEI. I want to learn how to have difficult conversations. I want to learn how to help people feel included. And if you're interested in any of these activities, let us know. I'm sure we can involve you. So last but not least, we have a master plan. And I know our architects are curious about this, but maybe some of the rest of you are too. We just had our 10-year plan uh, approved by the Board of Regents. We're not standing still. Don't worry, we're not going to take over Iowa City. Don't worry, Bruce, we're not going to grow that much. But we have a lot of projects that we are going to be working on. Some of them are on the west side of campus. Some are on the east side. I don't have time to go into all of this. And I think Rod left. He was here before, but he was going to punt to him if he wanted to say anything. But the thing is, we have work to do on, on the side of, uh, on the east side because the union needs some help. It needs a little bit of a facelift. I don't know if any of you have been in IMU lately, but it needs some help. Uh, we're going to work on the library. We've got Tippy is exploding and it needs some additional uh, space. And then on the west side, we've, we have, we turn patients away every year. We turn, we turn away over 2,000 patients around the state that need critical care and we can't uh, help them. So we're going to have to grow our capacity to um, take on tertiary patients and make sure our healthcare enterprise is as strong as can be, which will mean a more vibrant economy, but it means our west side needs some help as well. So I'm happy to talk to any of you individually, or Rod will, about the plan, but all those circles that you see are projects, but it's this is a 10-year process. So we're not going to be starting. Don't worry, the cranes aren't coming in tomorrow. Sorry, I'm talking, looking at my architect friends. You're, we got you busy, but we, you know we have a lot of plans to make sure that our campus continues to be as beautiful as it can be. Um, what, what's on the horizon in terms of students? I hope you've seen a lot of students walking around if you're in the community. The good news is we have a growth plan. We're not going to go crazy. We are not going to become the Ohio State University, but we are at about 31,000 and our enrollment plans say over the next five years we'd like to grow to maybe 33 to 34,000. So you can count on a little bit of modest growth, but we never want to be so big that students feel lost and disconnected from our university. And the good news is we are rocking it on campus visits. We are up 
9% on campus visits this year, uh, and our housing applications are up as well at this point, so for the residence halls. So we continue, yeah, you can clap for that, that's good news, thank you. I think being open during the pandemic, although I know it's been a little controversial, but it's been helpful for a lot of our students and families who are really eager to be back on ground in face-to-face -face residential learning. So we're, we're excited about growth. So that's what our success looks like. Talent magnet, uh, increased success of students, boosting mental health and wellness, enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I have to show you my last slide. Um, I stuck this in this morning, asked, my, um, asked Pete to drop it in here, because I want to just end on saying none of this will be possible without partnership with this community. We are uh, intertwined completely, <laughs> absolutely. And what I would say is, you know, as our destiny goes, so does this community and vice versa. And I want to just tell you, end on this brief story. I had taken this position and I was, my husband and I were still in Champaign, Illinois, and I got the strangest email from some people I didn't know saying, we're coming to Champaign-Urbana to talk to the community about building an arena. And uh, we're wondering if we could have lunch with you. And I'm like, who are these people? And so I immediately emailed Pete and Laura and said, are these legit? I don't know who these people are. Like, am I supposed to meet with them? And they, oh yeah, these are important people. Go ahead and meet with them. Well, I mean, people were still mad that I was leaving and my neighbors were like, what the heck are you doing? So I decided, okay, we can't go to a restaurant. I'll invite them over to the house and we'll just get some Jimmy John sandwiches. Little did I know they're gonna drive up in my neighborhood in Illinois in an Iowa City car. Um, and you know, all, this caused quite some quite some interest around the neighborhood uh, at that point in time. So I, I you know, I want to say to to Nancy and to Mark and Kim and Josh and Kate, you've been great partners. Uh, you've welcomed me from the beginning when I still lived in Illinois. Our commitment is to this community. We want to be great partners. We want to be at every table as we think about how we grow this place, improve the lives of all of our citizens, and make possible this is the place where people will stay or they'll leave and then come back, right? I'm sitting with two of our alums who said we went to DC and now we're back here because we want to start a business here. That's what we're looking for. So let's work together to make this the greatest small, large, big, tiny Hawkeye community that could ever exist. Thank you very much. <laughs> to meet President Wilson. Thank you for having us uh, to your home and letting us show up in, in the Think Iowa City vehicle. Um, but gosh, see what I mean? Isn't she incredible? Uh, I mean, I just, just couldn't be more excited. So um, I want to, we've, we've talked a lot about Better Together 2030. Um, and so so they move there, there. So we're in the final stages of this, this project, and our goal really is to present uh, a data-driven and compelling vision for our community to you this spring. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna play a video that will give you a glimpse uh, into what we're trying to accomplish, why we think this work is important, and how we're going to do the work. Uh, my hope is that this video will inspire you, perhaps to join us in this effort, or just leave you with some really good feels about where the community is headed. Um, but I first wanna give a quick shout out to my peers that President Wilson just mentioned, Nancy Bird with the Iowa City Downtown District, Kate Moreland with ICAD, Josh Schomberger with Think Iowa City. I, I just, you know, we spearheaded this project, we are spearheading this project together, and I just get to be the lucky one to, to share this at our annual banquet. Too. So thank you to, to you three for being my partners in crime. <laughs> 
And I also want to thank uh, our fellow sponsors of this project, Johnson County, the City of Iowa City, the City of Corville, the City of North Liberty, the University of Iowa, the Iowa City Community School District, and the Community Foundation of Johnson County. We, we cannot do this work alone. That's kind of, that sounds like the theme for tonight, and we're gonna need even more support once we launch this, this vision. So thank you to, to those who are sponsoring this work. And lastly, I want to acknowledge the amazing Better Together 2030 Steering Committee, led by President Wilson, uh, Kate Moreland, and Angie Jordan, who's a community leader and founder and director of Banjo Knits Empowerment. It is an impressive group on the steering committee of, of business people, of government officials, nonprofit leaders, high school students. We just, there, there are a lot of different folks involved from across the community. Um, I want you all, I know a, a bunch of you are here tonight, so please stand if, if you're on the steering committee. Uh, President Wilson, that includes you, Angie, Pierce, please stand. Uh, thank you for your time and, and talent towards this effort. Okay, now for the video. Anytime you're envisioning anything, uh, you want to create these safe spaces that uh, folks can access. Not just the one time or the two times, but for the always and forever. As we built relationships, worked together to improve our community during this crisis time, this next phase is really exciting because it brings about a bit of hope. My hope is that this plan will allow Iowa City and the surrounding communities to be the best place to live in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. We work really hard with our stakeholders to make sure that we're meeting the promise of our brand. And so when we're all on the same page with what that brand is and what our promise is, uh, I think it's going to hopefully touch everybody in the community and they're going to feel it. Particularly our, probably our public entities, our nonprofit entities, and having a community vision is, is something that they could potentially align their own visions to uh, and, and collectively we can all work towards that together. And through the pandemic, one thing that uh, we noticed very early and, and has, that we've noticed often has been the real efficiency at which we were able to work when we align. So we've been working with a futurist, Rebecca Ryan, on this foresight process, which really has us looking at our data and determining what kind of future we want to have in order to respond. Where is our growth? What are the areas of deficit? And it's been really, really an interesting process. What, what I really like about it is that it's been uh, very inclusive. Uh, we're looking to engage all sorts of voices, as well as voices who normally aren't at the decision-making table. Uh, and it's also very data-driven. I think the process has been pretty fascinating. We're working with some scenarios and strategies. We're almost working backwards to understand if this is where we want to be, and this is how I want to feel in 2030, then these are the things, these are the steps that we need to take to get there. For me, the most important part of any process is the actual process, getting in a room, getting on Zoom, talking through issues, kind of grappling with the sticky and challenging issues. You know, some of the early themes are certainly centered around some of the inequalities that um, our community continues to face um, and where growth is going to happen in the coming years. As we grow, how do we think about equity? Um, because we don't ever want to get into a place where certain individuals and certain groups of individuals are prospering and others are not. But I also keep seeing the need to practice, the need to practice being vulnerable, the need to uh, practice asking for help, the need to practice and perform and have feedback on sharing our ideas. We do have a website, it's uh, icareatogether.com. If you go to that website and there's a About Better Together 2030 page, uh, at the bottom of that page is an area where you can sign up uh, if you're interested in getting engaged uh, in this vision work. If you're someone that wants to get involved in certain areas, um, raise your hand, be part of those strategic sessions, um, projects that will emerge from this. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for the community to come together and execute this vision. Once this larger vision is developed, it'll be our goal to make sure that if people want to be involved in pushing forward to meet the vision, they have an opportunity to do so. I think as we move forward and complete this visioning process, it's going to be absolutely critical that uh, it doesn't sit on a shelf. 
it's activated. I really am hopeful that this is just the beginning. And what we create, we can't even imagine how incredible it's going to be that we keep moving towards it because it will take all of us all the time, forever. With strategic foresight, we intentionally leave the past behind. So this process is a visioning process. It's about trying to see into the future and then create a future that can be shared by the community. The Big Sort is a tabletop game that anybody can play. And what we did for Johnson County was we identified 36 trends and then we dealt those trends out. And then we just discussed and frankly debated how certain are we that this trend is actually going to come true in the future? And if it does come true, how much impact will it have? We're almost three-fourths of the way through the process. We're in the process now where we've identified 10 possible strategies that will give us a 2030 that we'll, we can all be proud of and will we'll bring prosperity for all of us. And now we're asking the community, both through circles, the circle process, and through online feedback, which are their priorities and what we've missed. My experience in Johnson County so far has been, wow, the impact of the university is seen everywhere, not just in the economy, but also as we've been playing the big sword, as we've been going into the community, the amount of thoughtfulness, the amount of questioning, the amount of wanting to make sure that we get things right is, is pretty remarkable. What I would say overall is if you think quality of life is terrific today, it will be more terrific for more people at the conclusion of Better Together 2030. Thank you to Quentin from the uh, Think Iowa City team who produced this, this awesome, awesome video. Um, as Rebecca Ryan, our consultant, mentioned, there's a lot of thought and a lot of questioning uh, going into this work, as you can imagine, uh, knowing our community. Uh, Rebecca also referenced a survey. Uh, this is where all of you come in. We, we need your feedback uh, to help refine and prioritize those 10 strategies that have ident been identified from our trend sorting and our scenario planning activities. Um, a QR code for that survey is, is on the screen here, so feel free to grab a picture of that and you can pull it up tonight. Uh, we'll also be emailing you all a link um, to that survey tomorrow. I encourage you all, it's really quick, um, please take it, please share it with friends, family, teammates. Uh, we want to get as many folks across the community uh, to take this survey. And so, uh, and we'll, we'll keep you posted uh, on kind of the next stages in this work. And again, as we mentioned in the video, we would just have, uh, would love to have as many folks involved in this work as possible. Once the vision is launched, there's gonna be execution teams and, and this is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a journey, but we've got a really, really exciting future ahead of us. Um, so with that said, I think we're at our close here tonight. Um, again, I, I want to thank our, our lead sponsor, P&G, all of our table sponsors. I want to shout out to the Hyatt team. Gosh, it's good to be back here in person. Thank you to your team and all, all your work. And thank you, President Wilson, for your phenomenal presentation. And thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you have a good rest of the evening, and I'll see you all soon.